The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of GodQuest Ministries. What is our most compelling evidence? What's the best one we got? Well, this is the Creation Today Show. I'm one of your hosts, Eric Hoven, and I'm joined by the amazingly smart Paul Taylor. Well, I, we're going to indeed be talking about our most compelling evidence because we received a very long email <laughs> and we're going to be tackling that email uh, with lots and lots of questions about evidence, the sort of evidence that we should be providing to people. I know everybody's looking for that silver bullet. What's the one that I can use that nobody can put down? Well, just so you know, we believe that the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate in every detail. If you have questions, you can send those into questions at creationtoday.org or join us on Facebook, facebook.com slash creation today. I am really excited about the show today because we're answering some of your questions that have come in and uh, I, I just, these are good questions that really deserve good solid answers and we really want to help equip you to defend your faith in God. A couple of announcements real quick. We've always got new products and resources available at creationstore.org to help you strengthen your faith in the Word of God and help equip others uh, to defend their faith in God as well. So I encourage you to check that out. Absolutely, and you mentioned that we've got questions today. In a sense, we've got one question today. It was a very long question <laughs> yes, it was. in lots of bits. <laughs> uh, so we split it up into bits. They did the shotgun yeah. approach to uh, asking the question. They thought, well, if I'm only going to get one, it's going to be a long one with yeah. lots of elements. Well, what we've got is a, a long email really from uh, Eli, and he asks four questions really as part of this email, but we're going to give five answers nice. to these four questions. Even better. Yeah. And so, so here's where it starts. And this is the context. He begins the email like this. He says, hey, I have questions about some things that I was debating with my friends about, and I had a hard time explaining some things. Uh, there are, these are friends that I talk to all the time about this stuff. Uh, that presumably means creation. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This stuff, and because that's what we are, we are this, this, yep. this stuff. So today. far, he sounds like our producer. <laughs> Have a hard time explaining things, but uh, oh well. Uh, they always come to me with questions because I hold a different viewpoint than they do, and they know that I can explain a lot of things. That's great, and glad you can do that, Eli. They know I can explain a lot of things that they have problems with, which I'm thankful to you and your dad for. I think he's referring to your dad. He's not mistaking me for your oh, dad. Okay. Although, uh, <laughs> and uh, you guys gave me the knowledge, that knowledge to spread God's love. These are mainly my friend's questions and some of mine. All right. Well. So first of all, I want to say, Eli, thanks for sharing your faith and, and defending your faith to others. You're doing what probably, what, 98% of other believers do not do. It's, uh, it's been shown in surveys that less than 2% of Christians actually regularly share their faith with non-believers. So thank you for sharing your faith. We really appreciate right. that. I mean, there's a lot of non-believers who, there's not a lot of believers rather in churches who, who don't have unbelieving friends even That's to true. share the faith with. That's true. So yeah, full marks for that. And uh, there's, a, there's a scripture, isn't there, that, uh, that's really pertinent to this, which is uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, hmm. where it says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I learned that one in Awana, approved workmen are not ashamed. Dun, right. dun, 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 dun. I'll stop. Hail Awana. Anyway, I learned a lot of scripture there, and that was one of them. So, Eli, we're glad you're learning scripture. One of the questions, the first, uh, first ones he comes in on is uh, about the Grand Canyon. Yes. He says, uh, how do you justify the Grand Canyon as not being the end result of erosion? Also, how was it made in your view and justify how it was made if the flood created the Grand Canyon? Wouldn't it have like eroded or pressed down the whole part of the Grand Canyon, not just the part of the river? Well, good questions. It's a very good question. And I think we could do with an expert on the Grand Canyon really to help us with this. You are blessed because we actually have an expert on the line that's going to help us answer this question. He lives in Flagstaff, Flagstaff Arizona from creationministry.org. Russ Miller is joining us. Russ, thanks so much for helping us out here. Good afternoon there, Eric. Hi, Paul. How are you guys doing? 
We're doing really well. We got this question that came in about the Grand Canyon. He, this uh, Eli wants to know, how do we justify the Grand Canyon as not being the end result of erosion? And I would say, well, we do say it was erosion. I think perhaps if we just read part of the question again, I think it, what you might want to address here is, is that I think he may have got the wrong end of the stick about how it was formed. He says, if the flood created the Grand Canyon, wouldn't it have pressed down the whole part of the Grand Canyon, not just the part that has the river in it? So how would you answer that, uh, that question? Well, I think uh, Eli has asked a very good question that I think literally hundreds of millions of people have all around the globe. And as God told us, we need to be able to provide a reason for the hope that's in the heart. And he has, God has provided us with that answer. Uh, the Grand Canyon had, actually the Colorado River has nothing to do with the formation of Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon was formed quickly and then the Colorado River entered the early formed canyon. The, uh, uh, a lot of times I'm asked, uh, if, if a, a global flood resulted in Grand Canyon, why don't we have hundreds of Grand Canyons around the world? I like to ask a question, then answer both. I, I like to say, well, if rivers carve out huge canyons over millions of years, and if the earth is billions of years old, why don't we have millions of Grand Canyons around the world? <laughs> and, and the answer to both of those questions is that the Grand Canyon took a very special set of circumstances to form. At the end of the flood, the mountains arose and the valley sank down. And during this massive tectonic event, the Colorado Plateau, through which the, the uh, Grand Canyon cuts, got pushed together and formed the Kaibab Upwork. It's through this upwork that Grand Canyon cuts. So either that, that upwork acted as a huge earthen dam at the end of the flood that caught flood runoff and runoff from the Colorado Plateau for years after the flood to the waters breach that earthen dam, or the, the very last of the floodwaters, as they were running off, they channeled and cut through, and the waters poured through that forming chasm. Either way, the canyon formed very quickly. That's the reason the walls are straight up and down. There's no rock debris hardly in the Grand Canyon, and on and on we can go with the overwhelming proofs that Grand Canyon formed quickly by a massive breach of that earthen dam. Just like the canyons of Mount St. Helens formed very quickly, just like the 15,000 miles of scab lands in eastern Washington formed quickly by massive water flow. That's a great question. Okay, so when an evolutionist says, hang on, you Christians are so silly. No, the ground rose up around as the river cut through. We agree that the ground rose up, but we don't agree that the river kind of kept cutting it down over millions of years. That ground is uplifted and we can see that happening. Eric, that's the ancient river theory that the upwork uh, uh, rose up at the exact same rate the river is cutting through the upwork, but that's been scientifically debunked for, for 50 plus years. They know this because the north end of the upwork um, through which Grand Canyon cuts has horizontal Wasatch layers laid down against it upwork. That mm. proves the upwork was there before the layers um, because otherwise the layers would have been uplifted with the upwork. But the event that eroded through the canyon cuts through both the upwork and the Wasatch layers. So we know the upwork was there first, the Wasatch layers second, and the event that carved through those layers uh, happened uh, last. So that debunked the ancient river theory, and it's actually been debunked for years. Some folks still promote it, and a lot of people still believe it because the old earthers own the system, and they really don't have a viable way to explain the canyon's formation. Wow, that is very helpful in answering that question. Uh, tell you what, we're going to uh, we're, we're going to take a break here in just a second. But man, I'd like to I'd like to have you on for a complete show sometime to help explain. I know you do tours of the Grand Canyon, and uh, I got to go on one of those. But I'd love to go on a, on, on a tour with you and just have you on as a, for a whole show to to teach us more about the Grand Canyon. Would that be all right? We'd love to do that. Absolutely. Man, that'd be cool. He's got a lot of knowledge on the Grand Canyon. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Okay, well, we got uh, three more parts of this question and four more answers that we'd like to give. Uh, we'll be back right after this to give those answers to you.
Join Eric Hoven and Paul Tater from Creation Today with special guest Ken Ham from Answers in Genesis, along with Carl Kirby of Reasons for Hope, Mark Spence of Living Waters, and Cy Ten Brugenkate of Proof That God Exists for the Proof of God Conference in Orlando, Florida, October 12th through 13th. For more information, visit us online at proofconference.com or call toll free 877-479-3466. Welcome back. You're watching the Creation Today show with me, Paul Taylor, and with Eric Hovind. Well, we're in the middle of answering a very long email uh, from Eli, who was wanting us to give us some thoughts, give him some thoughts really on um, the sort of answers that he should give to his atheistic friends. And we covered along with our special guest, Russ Miller, yeah, love uh, that, man. great question about the Grand Canyon. Well, Eli goes on because we've got three more questions uh, uh, to answer. And he says this, what, why is the geological time scale inaccurate? How come just because something is deeper doesn't mean that it's older? Mm. He says, I tried explaining the petrified tree example to my my friend, but he didn't grasp it that well. Maybe you can explain it better. Okay, it is interesting that they do find petrified trees that are running up to the different layers, and they say these the layers on the bottom are much older by thousands or possibly millions yes. of years. Uh, in, in Tennessee, they found a petrified tree where the top and bottom were in two totally different coal seams, and those coal seams are supposedly thousands of years different in age. And this obviously goes against the idea that the layers were laid down slowly over millions of years is what they're going against. That's right. In fact, it's interesting, actually, you mentioned coal seams because uh, our good friend John Mackay, um, yeah. uh, prior to uh, uh, his ministry, was involved in, in geolo geology and his particular specialism was to do with coal seams. Mm. And uh, he, he says that almost everywhere where you find coal seams, you will find polystrate fossils. And uh, the, the mine owners will often not really want you to know that fact. <laughs> but I remember him uh, showing, uh, showing myself and uh, uh, my youngest son um, uh, some coal seams, some tiny coal seams that are not being worked, they're far too small to be worked, on the west coast of Wales, and a polystrate fossil going right through uh, these coal seams. It, and of course the, the point is that that presumably to form must have been there as a tree just stood there rotting away for millions and millions of years while the sediment slowly covered it. Just doesn't make sense according to their worldview. Yeah. Okay, well, getting to this question, though, uh, are, the, are the layers that are deeper, are they older? Is that what that means? Well, it's possible that in some cases, the layers that are deeper are older by as much as maybe a couple of days in some <laughs> cases, or maybe a couple of weeks. Uh, that's not necessarily the case, but it could be that in some areas, you've got some layers laid down early in the flood, other layers on top of that. So it could be talking about that, but of course, you've got all sorts of other effects, lots of things being uh, churned around, and uh, millions of years old, Earth geologists ha find so many things that they simply can't explain. But maybe we could just pick up on one thing, because uh, Eli, you said, uh, is the geological time scale inaccurate? And in a sense, that's the wrong word to use. It's not that it's actually inaccurate, it's that it's false. Mm. Um, that's a great because, point. Because uh, there is a presupposition behind this uh, geological time scale. Now, you know, we're going to answer a question uh, briefly about radiometric dating, but they don't radiometrically date. Um, fossils, because radiometric dating is done on igneous rocks, fossils by definition are found in sedimentary rocks. So maybe uh, they could try and find an igneous rock that's close by a sedimentary rock layer, but you're not measuring the dates of the fossils directly. And what they actually did, you see the millions of years was developed before radiometric dating came along anyway. That's fascinating. Uh, you know, the, the uh, old earth geologists, people like Lyell and so on, looked at the rocks and probably more specifically James in Scotland looked at the rocks and said well we think it must have taken the this number of millions of years for such and such a height to form therefore to get from this end of a, of a column in situ to, to up to the top end must have been however many million, millions of years they calculate and that's where the millions of years came from it came from presuppositions about the creatures found in the rocks and the time that they reckon it must have taken for the sediment to form so it's not that the geologic column is inaccurate because there are layers of sediment. That's right. 
we're arguing and we're saying that the idea that the layers form slowly over millions of years is a false idea, yes. and that's really where the whole point comes uh, in. There is a geologic column, or rather not one, but in lots of different places in the world, there are many geologic columns that you see. The question is, is that a time scale? We would say, no, it's not a time scale. What you're actually finding there is because you've got certain related fossils, such as you're finding dinosaurs along with gymnosperm fossils, that presumably means they're not that they're from the same era, but that they're from the same environment. Mm. The particular part of the pre-flood world where dinosaurs lived is the place where gymnosperm plants tended to grow. And the particular part of the pre-flood world where mammals lived was part, uh, there were lots of angiosperm flowering plants growing. And that's what it is, it's an environmental thing, not an, an era time scale thing. Now you might not understand that unless you understand that the geologic column does not exist in its entirety right. anywhere in the world. I mean even the Grand Canyon you don't get the full geologic column. They've taken the separate layers that they find around the world and they've kind of merged them all yes. together to make one big giant geologic column. Right. If the geologic column did exist in one place it would be I've, I've heard over a, over 100 miles thick yes. to equal all the sediments that they have put together. Yes. So you're right, it's really more of the environments that they're in. It's not, they're not all found in one place like, they, like, like the geologic yes. column tries to point out so that you can say dinosaurs were first and then and it goes birds and it goes up That's there. right, though there, there are the things that we can say such as the fact that dinosaurs almost always are found with gymnosperms and as I said, we've got an alternative explanation as to why that happened. That's from their environment. Great, great question by Absolutely. the way and a lot of people don't understand this stuff so I'm so glad we're able to explain it. Wonderful. And the next bit of the question went on. Yeah. Is radioactive isotope dating inaccurate? If so, how? Well, once again, the word inaccurate is the wrong word to use, Eli, That's but a for point. a different reason in this case. When you take the, uh, the, the, a piece of rock to a laboratory, the experiment that they do on the rock, they are very good experiments as they do it very, very accurately indeed. What they're actually measuring, though, is not the date. They're measuring, say, in uranium lead dating, they'd be measuring the amount of uranium in the rock and the amount of lead in the rock. That's what they measure, and they do that very accurately indeed, because they're good scientists. The like, so how many, because they, yeah. they can get the uranium lead, they can get that out to like thousands of, or uh, hundreds of decimal places. They can really Absolutely. get it. Absolutely. I mean, they can get yeah. how many actual atoms of yeah. lead are in the, in the, yeah. in the, in the These elements. are very, very careful uh, scientists. The point then is what's done with those results because there is a calculation done on the amount of uranium and the amount of lead in order to try and calculate what the age is. But the calculation requires some extra knowledge. First, they've got to know how much lead was there in the original rock. And they usually assume that there was none whatsoever. Second, they've got to assume that no lead was either put into the rock or taken out of the rock for the millions of years that that rock was there, which is completely unprovable. You can't prove nobody shot that thing, filled but, it full of lead. Yeah, absolutely. But <laughs> thirdly, they've got to assume that they know that the rate at which uranium turns into lead, uh, a, a quantity known as the half-life, must have stayed the same for the lifetime of that mm. rock. And what's interesting is that many creation scientists have done some work uh, in the rate book, the radioactivity and the age of the earth books to show that actually that assumption itself is probably not correct, that it's very, very likely that the uh, half-life of uh, radioactive species like uh, uranium has changed rapidly in the past. That rate project is fascinating. Maybe we could take a minute to talk about that at the beginning of the next segment because it really is fascinating. Let's come back and talk about that rate project, finish answering that question, and then we'll get to the third part of his question and our last answer that he didn't want. Creation Today is introducing a new audio resource, the Holy Bible on Double Speed. Because it is difficult to find the time for lengthy reading sessions, we sometimes miss the big picture produced by reading an entire book of the Bible or a large section without interruption. The first disc of this three-disc set presents Alexander Scorby's wonderful reading of the Bible at the original recorded speed. The second disc is digitally enhanced to one and a half times faster than the original speed. The third disc is literally double the speed of the original audio recordings. You can now listen to the entire Word of God in 37 hours. These MP3 files can be easily copied to your MP3 player, cell phone, or iPad. You can take it with you for your daily commute. We offer free downloadable playlists to maximize your reading options. With this new resource, we invite you to fly through the Bible to gain an amazing new view of God's Word.
Welcome back to the Creation Today Show, where we're answering Eli's questions, or a yeah, series of questions all in one question, about what is the best evidence, what's the best proof. And we just got done talking about the RATE project, which is fascinating because a group of scientists from the Institute for Creation Research actually did tons of scientific, scientific experiments dispelling the idea that radioactive uh, dating methods can give us the ages that we're looking for as far as the millions of years. Talk about that for a second, Paul. You can do some uranium lead dating on zircon crystals, which are found in micas inside granite. And in that particular case, because these are buried so deep in the granite, we can actually justifiably uh, uh, eliminate uh, two of the three assumptions on radiometric dating. The idea that any lead would be washed in or washed out, that's not going to okay. happen in those. And uh, also, we can probably reasonably assume that there was no lead originally. So if there are any problems, it's to do with the half-life of uranium. Now, every time one uranium atom turns into lead, at the end of this process, um, eight alpha particles will have been emitted. Each of those alpha particles, as it gains electrons, will become helium atoms. So basically, we're saying that one uranium atom produces one lead atom and eight helium atoms. Now, we then find how many helium atoms there are still in the zircon crystals. But that's not going to be the same amount of helium as would have been originally in the crystal because the helium leaches away. Uh, it diffuses away, rather like if you've got a helium balloon and it floats up to the ceiling. It's not yeah. going to stay on the ceiling. The helium eventually comes out through the... <laughs> Uh, the mo between the molecules of the, uh, uh, the latex that the balloon's made of, and eventually it will sink down to the floor. So um, you can then say how much helium has gone, how much helium should there have been originally, how much helium has gone. Now, if you know how long the crystal has been there, then you can work out the rate of diffusion. The thing is that you're going to have two different rates. One rate is the millions of years rate, based on the idea that the uh, crystals have been there for about 1.5 billion years. And the second one is based on the idea that these were created, creation rocks, day three rocks, 6,000 years ago. You then get different crystals at different temperatures, different, uh, therefore, diffusion rates of uh, helium. And you plot two graphs, and you get two curved graphs parallel to each other. One's the creationist calculation, one's the uh, evolutionary calculation using the same, uh, same measurements of helium. What you can then do is take some other crystals, and you can deliberately heat them up even hotter and measure how fast the helium is uh, diffused from them. And you plot those results from various different crystals on the graph and you have to see then are they going to match the creationist rates are they going to match the evolutionary rates or are they not going to match either and what you find is that the experimental rates absolutely perfectly match the creation rates and that gives us very strong evidence uh, that the earth is just 6,000 years old but here's the big but because the uh, the uranium lead measurements were actually done accurately the, we, we, there's nothing inaccurate about the way that they did the uranium lead dating in the sense of the measurements. So in that case, if they'd measured those amounts correctly, the only factor that could be affected is the half-life. So the only way that you can rationalize these two things of the crystals producing the right amount of helium for a 6,000-year age, but producing radioactivity for a 1.5 billion-year age, the only factor that can possibly change there is that the half-life of uranium must at some point in the past have gone rapidly out of control much faster than it is today. So are we still creationists based on all that? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. What, we're, right. what we're saying Woo! is that the crystals Good. were not there for 1.5 billion years old, but actually they gave out what would have seemed to be 1.5 billion years worth of radioactivity, but at some point the actual radioactive rate must have gone very, very fast within that 6,000 year time frame. Got it. Which brings us then to a much more <laughs> scientifically compelling question okay. which is right. Eli says is what, spinning on that one. what is the most compelling evidence or proof that the earth is young wow what's the most compelling evidence let's see we've got soft tissue and dinosaur bones could be that couldn't it? i don't think it's that one okay no. we've got a pe rapid petrification that it doesn't take millions of no, years no that's not the best one hmm. okay we've got uh let's see here what else do we have oh we've got the uh uh the earth's uh 
uh, magnetic field is is actually decreasing. It used it's to be stronger one. in the past. So good it piece of evidence, couldn't. but it's not that one. Mm. Oh, we got the human population. There it is. The human population today is at seven billion. If you go back in time, it accounts for about 4,400 years of human history, not millions of years. So the human population has got to be like right up there at the top. That it's like a very good piece of evidence, but yeah. it's not that one either. All right, let's see here. Back the to most my age of the Earth DVD days. Let's see here. Um, all right, what, what do you got? I'm throwing out some good ones here, and you're it's, tossing them all back. It's the Bible. Ah. Oh. The Bible. The Bible gives us the dates. And, of course, there are lots of pieces of evidence which are consistent with the Bible. But the point is, if you don't start with the Bible, then you can't actually prove anything. That's so and true. I heard a, very, I heard a DVD, uh, sorry, a CD of an audio presentation from somebody who was saying that if you don't start with the presupposition that God exists, then you can't actually know anything. I now, think I remember. That have been? I think I remember uh, there were two guys that did that. Let me see here. They were, uh, oh, it was me and Sides and Bergenkate. Yeah, I remember doing that one. Yeah, and we're, we're fooling around here, but it's a very, very important yeah. point. If you listen to uh, what Eric has to say on that, uh, on that CD in conversation with Sides and Bergenkate, it's the point that you can't know anything if we don't start with the presupposition that God exists. This really does have to be our foundation. I tell you, as we travel to churches and present this, and and uh, the Proof of God Conference, of course, presenting this information. Uh, it is more powerful than, than the human population, than dinosaur bones. Than if we found a live dinosaur today, it would be more powerful because it is the source of knowledge. Without this, you can't even prove anything. And that, that really is powerful. We've got, by the way, if you don't understand that, there's some great articles on our website, creationtoday.org, that you can check out just yep. to see that. Uh, again, we've got some products available, artics, articles available, blogs available. Just did a blog. Uh, you and I both did a blog about Bill Nye, the That's science right. guy, uh, that, uh, that helps go into that. So I really encourage you to check that out. The Bible really is the best evidence, because without that, you can't prove anything. And which brings us, of course, very, very briefly indeed to the fifth answer to Eli's questions. He only asked four questions, which is actually you're not going to prove the point by throwing out loads and loads mm. of evidence out of context. You've got to have the context, which is that the Bible's true, that God exists. Because all atheists know that. Yeah, that's true. Romans 1 tells us everybody knows that God exists. We don't have to prove God to their satisfaction. Eli, you don't have to do that. Now, I'm really glad you can give evidence. And I'm not yes. against that because it is good for us to be able to defend yes. our faith in God and be able to have some evidences for people. As long as you're not using those evidence to put God on trial. Don't put God on trial. So sometimes what you might need to do is say, hang on just a second, how are you examining this evidence? And yeah. check that out. And you'll find out that they're not examining it in light of the correct worldview. That's what's got to change first before they can see uh, the truth of the matter. Yes, well, the uh, products that we mentioned uh, very br briefly, you can find them and lots more at creationstore.org. Yeah, and Paul Taylor, by the way, you just did one on uh, the age of the earth here that's really good in your Taylor that's Talks. I love that one. Talks, and then there's books and resources available. If you have questions, send them into questions at creationtoday.org. We hope you've enjoyed this show. Do you need the tools to defend your faith? Visit our websites for up-to-date content. Attend one of our live events. And shop online at creationstore.org. We are Creation Today.